Welcome to Bitcoins and Gravy, episode 35. Today, Bitcoins are trading at $380 and LTB coins are trading at 0. 0.000451 cents. Mmm, mmm, mmm. Now that's gravy. Welcome to Bitcoins and Gravy, and thanks for joining me today as I podcast from East Nashville, Tennessee, with my trusty sidekick, Maxwell, by my side. Say hello, Maxwell. (laughs) I'm just your average Bitcoin enthusiast who loves talking about Bitcoin and sharing what I learn with you, the listener. Thanks for listening, and I hope you enjoy the show. On today's show, I interview Nick Gogarty, co-developer and author of the Solar Coin White Paper. Nick talks to us about everything under the sun, including black swans, normal accidents, Warren Buffett's billion-dollar solar and wind investments, and Nick's own book, The Nature of Value. Nick also tells us how Solar Coin works to incentivize solar energy use and production and how SolarCoin is one of the very few altcoins in existence that has genuine economic utility. I also interview Paul Buggy, an American teaching English in Seoul, Korea. Paul gives us a look at how the Bitcoin movement is beginning to take off in South Korea and how it's definitely worth a visit, especially for the great food. Today on the show, I am thrilled to have Nick Gogarty back on for a second interview. Nick is the co-founder of SolarCoin, and he also wrote the white paper on SolarCoin. Nick, welcome back to the show. Thank you, John. Pleasure to be here. Oh, yes. So we talked to you, I'm not sure when, but it was many months back, Mm -hmm. and there have been some changes, and I would love to hear from you, and I'm sure our listeners would too, what kind of changes have been going on with SolarCoin and what we have to look forward to. Right now, the I guess the biggest and most immediate change is we are reducing the mining reward. Now, for some people, that may be controversial, but by and large, our community agreed to it. And so what's going to happen is by reducing the mining reward, we're anticipating the factors of supply and demand to most likely work in the favor of, let's say, uh, price probably improving. Uh, we're reducing the mining reward um, from 100 coins per minute mm-hmm. down to one coin per minute over the next 30 days or 33 days. Okay. And then after that, we're going to be moving all the way to a proof of stake, which will significantly reduce the carbon impact associated with the coin. I don't know if your listeners are familiar with proof of stake, but in essence, instead of mining to get coins, the way that the blockchain is maintained is people with their wallet stake their coins and a little bit of computational power. And by staking your coins or keeping your wallet online, you earn a 1% per year rate of return. Mm-hmm. And so the blockchain and the network is maintained by those stakeholders. Okay. One of the exciting things that's going on with SolarCoin right now is we have just launched in our 13th country, uh, France. For those of you not familiar with SolarCoin, the way it works is the coin is distributed to generators of solar energy globally. So anyone who basically has panels on the roof can claim uh, SolarCoin. And we've got now 13 countries uh, with people who are claiming solar coins. Nice. 13 countries. How many of those are in Europe? Uh, We've got Italy, Slovenia, Spain, France, Germany, Austria. There may be another one. I can't think of it off the top of my head. Yeah, that's all right. Yeah, I was reading an article a while back about how solar is actually now more affordable in Germany and some other countries in Europe than it is in the United States. And I'm wondering, do you have any information on that? I'm wondering, where are the costs that are keeping it too high for us? Uh, The reality is Germany actually had um, significant solar subsidies over the last few years. The interesting thing is, and I'm gonna take it up a level, solar is a global phenomenon in terms of the technology. So if somebody makes a cheaper panel or a cheaper silicon cell in Germany or in China, et cetera, it typically ships around the world. Mm -hmm. And so the cost of solar has been dropping significantly. And the cost of solar undergoes something called a learning curve or an experience effect such that every doubling of solar production, every time you ship you know, another two times as many solar panels, the cost drops 22%. Now, in, and that's been going on for about 30 to 40 years. Standard curve. It's kind of like a Moore's law for solar panels. Okay. 
So what that means is a lot of the subsidies Germany poured in over, let's say, the last 10 years have kind of fueled the solar innovation engine, if you will, mm -hmm. to they've brought panel costs down from $7 a watt just five years ago, uh, five or six years ago, to about $1 a watt now. Wow, that's impressive. Exactly. And so the phenomenal, the fascinating thing is, as that cost drops, new places that couldn't get by with solar, you know, without subsidies, all of a sudden become viable. Mm -hmm. And so the market for solar energy is growing about 20 to 30 percent a year. Wow, that's huge. And yeah, it is. It's a multi-billion dollar market. And as it grows uh, and more, let's say, value flows through the economy, solar economy, it gets cheaper yet opening up even new markets. So it's a very, very fascinating, exciting phenomenon. Wow, that really is. You know, I want to get back to SolarCoin, but before yes. we do, help me out with this. I had yeah. a comment from a listener, a very nice guy who commented about um, something I had mentioned on one of the shows, and he made the point, well, his opinion, yeah. that nuclear is our cleanest form of energy. And I came right back and I just basically said, I'll repeat the words, this is a family show, but I said, bullshit, <laughs> bullshit, bullshit. And I said, if you can tell me what we're going to do with all of the nuclear waste that we have right now on planet yeah. Earth, and if you can tell me what we're doing right now to make sure that the outdated nuclear power plants don't turn Fukushima on us, if you can tell yeah. me exactly what we're doing. And in addition to that, let's get a list together of the outdated nuclear power plants let's see if they're sitting on a fault line you know yeah. let's see if they're in a situation where we should be worried look i know without even looking into it that we're in a situation where we should all be really worried about it but i was going to ask you if you had to just sit on a panel right now it's a one-man panel and i'm asking yeah. the questions nick gogarty tell us please uh, which is cleaner solar power or nuclear power i'm going to say solar and the reason is because to your point the risks of a cleanup and the risks of something going wrong are much more uncertain with nuclear. Mm -hmm. And I'll categorize it as a risk function as much as, let's say, a clean function okay. um, <laughs> because they relate to each other. You know, if something goes wrong, it gets very unclean very fast. Right, right. <laughs> I'll say that. And we have in, in the U.S. 105 uh, reactors, I believe, 105 active, 109. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the median age of those things is probably 30 to 40 years old. And so that's old design, old technology. We have one of the highest risk uh, from a geological or geographic standpoint, actually, called Indian Point uh, here. It's about 30 to 40 miles outside of New York. And it does sit on a fault that is more active than it should be. How does that plant rate in terms of size uh, or output compared to Fukushima? Do you have any idea? I don't. I think it's a one gigawatt plant, which is kind of the standard build size for those things. But I don't okay. know about its its size. I wrote a brief a blog article on and using a, a geophysics report on the risk. And the article was on risk and how one of the problems when people look at geographic risk for these plants is they'll say, well, there's... I'll give you this example. There is a, let's say, these aren't the actual numbers, but let's say there's a one in a thousand chance every year of something happening. Mm -hmm. And someone will say, oh, okay, I can handle that, blah, blah, blah. The correct way to look at that is the build life of this plan is 50 years. And so now you're looking at a risk over the life of the plant of one in 20. Mm. That changes your perception significantly. Right. And so a lot of risk is expressed in an annualized basis, and you need to think about it over the lifetime of these things and think, you know, one, two, three generations out uh, because these things always get relicensed. No, so, no, no, no. I don't think we can think that far, Nick. <laughs> yeah, well, that, that, and that exactly <laughs> is the point is, you know, we think too short term and, and underestimate, let's say, the variability in the environment around us in terms of, of risks and changes and shifts. And, I agree. You know, short term, the word term is the operative phrase there because yeah. we can't think beyond four years. All of our thinking is who's going to be in the Oval Office next time. That's how far we can think. And that's really sad. Well, how far is that one that you mentioned? How how far is that from New York City? It's 30 to 40 miles. 30 to 40 miles. Wow. So if we had a Fukushima style meltdown, would that affect New York City at all? Inevitably, yeah. <laughs> it, it, it would be. It would not be good. No, it would not be good. But you know what? It probably won't happen. So let's not worry about it. No big deal. Let's let it go. Let's let it go. They've got duct tape there, don't they? <laughs> I run a, uh, a risk management group on LinkedIn uh, called The Black Swan, which is based on you know some of Taleb's work. Yeah, yeah. A very interesting book to read about accidents and risk accidents, either in finance or other areas, is called Normal Accidents. Hmm. And it deals with, you know, Chernobyl, which was a safety uh, management exercise, uh, ironically enough, hmm. and other types of accidents that occur almost by design. You know, just a confluence of a few errors and 
things happen. And so these systems are very, very complex. You can't plan or predict every eventuality. And so the margin for safety that's required should be enormous. And yeah. I think much, much larger than we've got. I mean, it's quite telling. Remember one uh, significant factor. The nuclear industry is subsidized, has one of the most interesting subsidies uh, in the world in every country. And that is they are effectively either insured or by default don't have to be insured uh, by the government. Hmm. If they had to get private sector insurance, you might not have a nuclear sector, a nuclear industry. Wow. So that's an interesting factor because the private sector, whether it be climate change or anything else, they're incentivized by money to understand risks. Okay? Right. So your catastrophe insurance guys, etc., they will talk climate change and they have no political agenda other than their pocketbook. Right. Uh, to understand those risks and mitigate accordingly. You know, so those are the sharp guys out there. And, and the fact that you can't effectively get insurance for one of these things is telling. Right. Well, you know, the way I look at it, Nick, is as long as we have insurance companies, lots of lawyers and lots of politicians, hey, what do we have to worry about? Oh, gosh. <laughs> Frightening. OK, so let's get back to the reality of the future, and that is sure. utilizing this great big ball of nuclear energy that sits up in our sky that we actually don't really even have to pay for. We don't have to pay for the source. Right. right. It's free. The source is completely free as long as you're living in, you know, in three dimensions. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but what is what does cost us, of course, is, as you mentioned, those costs uh, for photovoltaics. That is still right. what solar panels are. Right. Most of them. There's another technology called solar thermal, where you convert and you just focus the sun's energy into thermal energy. Solar thermal is, let's imagine, a giant tower, or some people use them for their swimming pools. You'll just run water across basically a black tarp on your roof, in essence, through capillaries through it, and it'll heat the water in your pool. Hmm. And China has a lot of solar thermal for hot water heaters, because it's cheap, effective energy. Right. But so most people, when they think solar energy, are thinking the photovoltaics and they're thinking on the roofs. And, and a lot of those panels now, you can get them effectively almost free or at cost uh, via leasing with companies like Solar City and others. Oh, wow. I didn't know Depending that. on where you live. Yeah, it's very, very cheap because the price of the technology has come down so significantly. And they know that, you know, basically you put the panels up on the roof and you've got a an energy stream, an energy flow that's good for 20 to 25 years. And so you can finance against it. You know, I really love the subject of solar energy. People should really look into it. I was reading an article just the other day about a company called Sun Science, and they have an energy system that integrates concentrated photovoltaic capacity for electricity and um, a thermal component for hot water. It's a hybrid system. They're using hybrid systems with solar and diesel. I know it sounds crazy. The other thing I was reading about that I'm fascinated with is the solar chimneys. And I really want to build one. It consists of a black painted chimney that you have attached to your house. I've even seen massive ones out in the middle of a field you know, photos of them. And during the day, the solar energy heats the chimney and the air within it, and it creates an updraft. That updraft can either run a turbine, which is amazing. I, I'm not, I wouldn't do that here at home. Or um, the suction created at the chimney's base can be used to ventilate and cool the building. So I could actually use that to heat my house in the winter and to cool my house in the summer. Of course, I'd have to build it <laughs> and have to do a little more research. But yeah, I think we've only scratched the surface when it comes to solar energy. I just feel like collectively in terms of our science, um, that's really where we need to be putting the money into research. But let's get back to talking about solar coin. So the way solar coin works is we just give out the coins, the distribution mechanism for the coin is effectively just to solar generators. And that is our physical proof of work. One of the, the let's say challenges, if you have a new form of currency is how do you get it into the hands of people? Now, regular currency, fiat currency is driven by a demand function. Mm -hmm. I.e., the demand function is taxes. You need this currency to pay your taxes and you know, it's legal tender. Mm -hmm. um, Bitcoin is kind of a demand function, but it's primarily early tech types right now that are a demand function. Mm -hmm. Okay. SolarCoin is approaching this problem and saying, well, let's make it a, a supply function. So we give the coin out as a grant to solar energy generators. The participants in any economy want to make sure that A, the currency um, isn't going to be inflated all the way over so that it you know, disappears in value. They also want to see and make sure that it's being given out in an equitable fashion, you know, so that, you know, 90% of it is known by one person and it's just a big scam or a Ponzi scheme. Mm -hmm. And so our solution to that was let's go with a physical proof of work. We will incentivize solar energy. The other interesting thing about that, I don't know if you're familiar with airdrops 
for coins, like yes. the Aurora coin. Right. So they give a coin out to everyone in Iceland, etc. They haven't been effective uh, or highly effective, I'll say that. And one of the reasons is because you'll get a few participants who sign up and they're like, okay, this is a great coin. They play in the economy. And all they can do is spend the coin once. It's a one-off transaction. The interesting thing about solar coin is you've got a relationship with the claimant. So the person's going to claim their initial claim for solar coin. They can go back to 2010 and say, hey, I got these panels for four years. Um, give me my solar coin. Hmm. And then they'll be able to get those coins over the next 20 years. So every six months, uh, we'll be granting out coins. So there's kind of a relationship with the end user, like, oh, hey, I got these coins, I'll accumulate them. We think it's a much more interesting way to grow an economy. And currencies gain their value uh, from two methods, uh, speculation and what is called economic utility. Mm -hmm. Speculation is the guys or, or women who get in because they think that things going up significantly. So you're in for the ride. Mm -hmm. That's great. That's an important function of any you know economy. The other form of value in a currency is its utility. Can you just buy and sell stuff with it? And the economic utility of a currency is a function of the number of participants in that economy. Like the network effect with Bitcoin. Exactly right. If you've got, right now, roughly there are about, let's make a guess, two and a half to three million users slash holders of Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. They support about a $5 billion to $6 billion economy, the Bitcoin market cap. Mm -hmm. Therefore, every one of those users is worth about $2,000, let's say. Right. Okay. That's pretty interesting. The reason we find that interesting is because if solar coin can get into the hands of a couple of hundred thousand people, given the number of coins out there, using similar math, far more conservative math, because it's a smaller network. So instead of a two thousand dollars per user, let's say each user is worth two or three hundred dollars, right? Mm -hmm. We can probably capture those users and get someone to sign up for basically free money once they can claim the equivalent of ten to twenty dollars. So if a user can say, hey, I, I've got these panels on my roof. I'm an average guy. I've got five kilowatts on my roof. Mm -hmm. I can go into your website and I can claim 10 or 15 coins for my first claim based on, let's say, the panels. And if we can get the coin to just a small price of about 33 cents is roughly what we've thought about internally. Okay. All of a sudden, the person is looking at getting 10 bucks, right? Yeah. We think that's enough of incentive for someone to say, okay, it's free. It's $10 in free money. I own solar panels. Maybe I'll give it a shot. Plus, I've got maybe $50 or $60 claims you know, in the future. The reason it's interesting is for the sake of $10 in the economy, we get a new user who may effectively be worth $100 or $200 or more in economic utility. Sure. And so we're anticipating a potential autocatalytic effect where the price goes up as there are more uh, participants and users and claims. So that's kind of what we're looking at. And we've modeled, again, we modeled Bitcoin, we plotted, and anyone can go and do this, plot the number of users that you guess were in the Bitcoin network against the price, and then calculate a per coin price to see what the economic utility of the Bitcoin is, and or the speculative component as well. Right. So we think we're going to enter a point, I know all that sounds very complicated, but what we're looking forward to is the potential where Every user that comes on to the SolarCoin network, if you will, claiming their free money, actually adds more economic value than they claim. Wow. And that, that's what we're kind of calling our autocatalytic price point. And so the network grows rapidly um, and can get very, very interesting. So it's quiet days. You know, it took Bitcoin two or three years to get out of like a penny or two. We're still sitting down there. Um, we think the changes to the reward function, all of a sudden, you know, within four to six weeks, you're only going to be able to get SolarCoin by claiming them. Uh, having solar panels, or you'll have to go buy them on a um, exchange. Both of those cases accelerate the uh, the demand. So well, we're very excited about that. That is exciting. Yeah, I love that term, autocatalytic effect. Exactly. And, you know, when we look at other altcoins, you know, people will argue this altcoin is better than that altcoin. But really, I think what a lot of people are talking about is the speculative utility. They're not calling it that. They're just saying, I believe in this and we believe in this. And we've got a bunch of people that believe in this. Maybe Dogecoin is a good example of that. Yeah. Um, but do they really have truly do they have economic utility, which, you know, could be defined by a lot of different factors mm -hmm. but with solar coin it seems to me like your economic utility is so crystal clear that it's almost a no-brainer especially when we consider that really solar is the future for energy on planet earth we're going to have to use solar energy or we're not going to exist for you know as long as we could otherwise right well it's going to be a very very interesting energy source again the, the important fact to remember is 
that that cost is dropping significantly. And the current installed solar energy base, you know, in the world is less than 1%, okay, of all installed energy. Mm -hmm. So you've got something that's getting cheaper, faster, and growing exponentially. And so it is... Um, it's going to be very exciting times, very interesting times in, in the energy world. I think so. It still seems to me like the energy giants, well, let's talk mm -hmm. about the energy giants. There's oil, <laughs> there's coal, and there's natural gas. Am I leaving anybody out? <laughs> well, <laughs> you, are, you are a little bit, but that's, that, let's leave it at that. <laughs> right, we'll leave it at that. Those are the real yeah. giants. You know, it just seems to me like you still have people who will argue, and they'll just argue those three. They'll say, coal is the future. We have a way of burning it clean now. Like, well, yeah, you can burn it a lot more cleanly than you could 20 yeah. or 30 years ago but still burning is burning right they burn solid waste now right i had a friend who once lived near a solid waste plant and it sure. created energy by way of burning solid waste and turning that into heat that heated the water that made the steam and we just need some basic in our public schools just some primers just one class maybe that talks about the physics of the world like how things actually work when you pull a switch on a lamp what's yeah. actually going on there well i think most kids would have no clue well there's a bulb in there for one thing right <laughs> and attached to that bulb is a cord okay well the cord goes into the wall well that's where the electricity comes don't stick your fingers don't stick a knife or a fork in there you'll get shocked turn off the lights you're wasting electricity well in the child's mind where does electricity come from it's in the walls of the house and it comes from a wire from outside but where does it come from what's the source people need to know hey when you turn that light on you leave that light on oftentimes like here in nashville you are burning coal yeah the future will inevitably have um you'll want a diversified portfolio of generating assets just because anything can go wrong that being said the great thing is the economics of solar are moving so fast and so forward that it's becoming interesting on its own right i mean one of the smartest investors out there berkshire hathaway okay warren buffett their uh, subsidiary mid-american energy huge investments uh, you know, multi-billion dollar investments in both solar and in wind. And the reason mm -hmm. is it's almost a bet against inflation. I put up a bunch of money up front to buy these assets, right, to build them. They're going to be generating electricity. And you pay for those assets with, you know, some fixed rate debt. If you think inflation is going up in the next 10 years and you've got an asset that's going to generate, you know, a known amount of electricity for a known price, that's a very interesting bet. So you have some of the smartest financial players out there who are going into the renewable sector uh, for that reason. Wow, I love that. Yeah. That's great so, news, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah, exactly. I mean, it's becoming less of an ideological argument and less of even a, a scientific theoretical one and becoming purely a pocketbook one just due to innovation. So there's just so much momentum. It's a, it's a fantastic place to be. Yeah, it also makes everything better. Right. So you wrote the white paper on the solar coin, but you also have a strong background in economics. I believe you have yeah. a keen knowledge of U.S. monetary policy and also you were involved with a hedge fund, isn't that right? Yeah, I've worked with one of the world's largest hedge funds. I just completed a book called The Nature of Value, which has a large section. It's for primarily for value investors, uh, but has a large section on the theory of money and uh, monetary economics, as well as I um, am a guest lecturer at Columbia University on innovation and macroeconomic planning and on portfolio allocation. Oh, wow. That program at Columbia University is the same one that Warren Buffett uh, attended years ago, the same class, actually. In value oh, wow. Investing. Yeah. Well, you sound like the kind of person that my listeners would love to, you know, <laughs> sit down and have a beer with or and sure. hey, hey, Nick, come over to, for dinner tonight and talk to us about <laughs> economics because we, we don't have a clue about what's going on. Most people don't. But so what sure. can you tell our listeners about the financial situation in the United States right now and how uh, not just solar coin, but uh, digital currencies and specific everybody's favorite Bitcoin, how Bitcoin is going to play a part? Or how you think it is? Well, I'd be hesitant to make forecasting judgments in the economic world or macro world, but I will say that we're going through a process called deleveraging. Basically, we're, we're deleveraging from the debt bubble that we had in 08. Uh, and it takes a long time to pay down effectively those debts. And so we've got uh, diminished economic growth currently. Mm -hmm. What that means for Bitcoin and the rest, I can't really say um, because I don't know if that deleveraging is enough to swing people's behavior to adopt Bitcoin or alt currencies. Mm -hmm. My own guess is that the rapid adoption of alt currencies and others may well happen in emerging economies or other economies. Mm -hmm. And the reason is the average currency globally, you know, across all the countries, the average currency 
has a 27-year life span before it gets reset or hyperinflation something happens. Now, the U.S. dollar has been fairly stable for quite a while. It hasn't had a significant change since, let's say, um, you know, 72, I believe, when it went off the gold standard. Mm-hmm. You know, and then prior to that, it was the gold adjustment in, in 33, 34. Right. So what that means, if I tell you the average uh, currency has a 27-year lifespan, that means on average, there's a 3.2% chance in a given year that currency is going to go off the rails. When that happens in a country, the individuals in that country seek a safe haven. They flock to a stable currency or some stable source of value. As you get more smartphones and more things out there, the likelihood that among the mix of things people flock to, whether it be gold, dollars, euros, etc., Bitcoin is considered a viable alternative, increase. And that could be a huge demand function uh, for alt currencies. You know, if you're talking about going from a network of maybe two and a half million people to all of a sudden, you know, three, four, five million people adopting a currency, uh, that's a huge, huge demand function. Yeah. So that's quite interesting. Outside of just the, you know, we've had a few merchants sign on and PayPal potentially to Bitcoin, etc. That's nice on the merchant side. There still hasn't been an extremely compelling reason for someone in the developed world, you know, your grandma, uncle, cousin, etc. to get Bitcoin. Right. Okay, you can shop at Overstock. Well, I can kind of do that with my credit card. That's okay. right. Well, you know, the reason to shift behavior hasn't been enough. So uh, we'll just have to see. I'm waiting for what I call the AOL moment in these currencies. And what I mean by this, I think the technology right now around Bitcoin user experience and these alt currencies, uh, including SolarCoin, is kind of clunky. And yes. it's kind of like email with CompuServe, uh, you know, back in the late 80s, for your, for your readers who are old enough to appreciate that, <laughs> you know, or, or the early 90s, where you couldn't even have an email address, you had a number. <laughs> right. It's one, two, three, four <laughs> at CompuServe. Okay. And then AOL came around and, and everything exploded on the net because it was so easy. It was a, a CD-ROM and a couple of clicks. Yep. I think Bitcoin is still waiting potentially for that moment. And it'll be huge when it happens. And I don't know whether that's, you know, two weeks away or, you know, two or three years, but the air is, is ripe. You know, the technology's been grounded, it's been beaten up enough and, and attempted at hacking and everything. So it's going to be interesting. I just don't know where that event is that triggers it. Yeah, I don't either. And talking <laughs> about incentive right now, I think the strongest incentive for people in the developed world is for small businesses who have um, yeah. a service or a product in particular, and they're selling online. You yeah. know, for me to convince the guy down the street that has a coffee shop, hey, accept Bitcoin, <laughs> it's going to, your business is going to take off. Well, how is his business going to take off here in Nashville? Yeah. We don't have that many people here with yeah. Bitcoin or traveling through with Bitcoin. Bitcoin. Certainly, you would see some change, as has uh, the restaurant here in town, Flight. They've seen some business from, mm-hmm. uh, but I don't know if, it, if they could say it's, you know, 5 or 10 or 15 or 20 percent. Although, on the other hand, we do have online businesses that will say, yes, 15, 20, 30, 40 yeah. percent increase in sales when they started accepting Bitcoin, because there are people out there with Bitcoin and there are Bitcoin millionaires who want to spend that Bitcoin and who are going to spend it online if they can find you. Yeah, exactly. And I think that you nailed it very well is one of the things in economics that is a cost for any good or service is called a search. Hmm. It's the economic cost, you know, like your doctor. Okay, did you search around for your regular medical doctor to look around who had the best prices? No, you just went with, you know, whoever you've had for a long time or, you know, a recommendation. Search, you know, for, for finding Bitcoin users in the physical world is almost a challenge. You know, you can't easily just go to your local coffee shop and your coffee shop doesn't have enough critical volume of people in the neighborhood who are all clamoring for Bitcoin. Right. So online goods and services are definitely the the early, um, they're going to be the early adopters and consumers. And for an online merchant, the space is so new that there's novelty to saying we accept this payment system that you can pick up a couple of extra customers if you have a good or service that, you know, is, is either national or, or international and can be you know, shipped or delivered in that way. Oh, I think so. Anytime I talk to a small business owner, I always ask them, do you have a service or a product that you're selling online? If yeah. they say yes, I'll say, well, you might want to consider Bitcoin and yeah. here's why. Well, I actually sell my book in SolarCoin at a fairly subsidized price and in Bitcoin. Uh, so if, oh, wow. if you go to, if you go to the website at the, the nature of value.com, the book is there uh, available for that. And that's the same materials, you know, just to give you an example of value in the book, the materials used there are the same materials that I use to teach a class at Columbia University. And those students are paying $160,000 for you know, two year education. So <laughs> $20 books are good value. <laughs> that is a good value. Okay, so tell our listeners again, how they can find that book. Sure. Uh, the title is The Nature of Value, okay. and the URL is the same, thenatureofvalue.com. 
thenatureofvalue.com. Great. Well, I will have that in the show notes, listeners. And Nick, thank you so much for taking time to be on the show again. Hey, thanks, John. Yeah, and I hope that uh, we can do this again in another six months and we can track the uh, progress of solar coin. I talked with the owner of Vault of Satoshi in Canada. He said, call me back in six months. So I'm calling him specifically in reference to getting him to put solar coin on his exchange. Yeah, well, we're on two exchanges and uh, volume is picking up a little bit. I think it's going to increase significantly with price and as it gets tougher to mine it'll be interesting to watch what exchanges are you on how can people get solar coin we are on all crypt a-l-l-c-r-y-p-t okay and bittrex b-i-t-t-r-e-x okay great you've been listening to nick gogarty talk about solar coin on bitcoins and gravy nick thank you so much once again for being on the show thanks john great to be here we'll talk to you again all right bye-bye I know that it may sound absurd, but I have for you a magic word. And today's magic word is sunshine. S-U-N-S-H-I-N-E. Sunshine. (laughs) Thank you very much, folks. (laughs) It is always great to be back here in Amsterdam. Yes. I love this city. I love the feel of it. I love the energy. I love the fact that you all have had so much to drink that I'm sure you're going to enjoy the performance this evening. (laughs) Uh, But seriously, folks, uh, I wrote this song uh, as a response to all of the stupid things I've done (laughs) uh, when it comes to Bitcoin uh, over the past three years and uh, all of my regrets that I have uh, and all of the times that I have legitimately had the Bitcoin blues. And so now I present for you... The Bitcoin Blues. Wasted all my time back in 09. I should have been mining blocks. Now all I've got's a Dogecoin rig and holes in my alpaca socks. I got them low down Bitcoin Blues. I'm crying, hear the low down of Bitcoin and news. I ain't lying to you, low down of Bitcoin blues. I'm dying, honey, low down of Bitcoin balloons. BTC convention came. To my hometown at last I had to sell my only Bitcoin Just to buy a two-day pass I got the low-down Bitcoin blues I'm crying the low-down of Bitcoin and news I ain't lying to you Low down the Bitcoin blues, I'm dying, honey. Low down the Bitcoin Young lady, I really hope that's your brother you're sitting next to because I finally got up the courage to ask you on a date after the show. I took a trip to China town for beef chow mein to go. Fortune cookie told me we know taking a bit to coin anymore. I got the low down Bitcoin blues. I'm crying, hear the low down of Bitcoin and news. I ain't lying to you, low down of Bitcoin blues. I'm dying, honey, low down Bitcoin balloons. I went up town to see my CPA for some advice. He told me death and taxes, son, 
And then just roll Satoshi dice I got them low down Bitcoin blues I'm crying here the low down of Bitcoin and news I ain't lying to you Low down of Bitcoin blues I'm dying honey Low down of Bitcoin balloons Thank you very much. <laughs> All right, so today on the show, I am a long, long way from home. I'm here in South Korea speaking with Paul Buggy, an English teacher who also happens to be a Bitcoin enthusiast as well as a gold and silver enthusiast. Paul, welcome to the show. Hey, great to be on. All right. And, you know, listeners, I'm not really in South Korea. <laughs> it's eight o'clock here in Nashville. And Paul, tell us what time it is there in South Korea. It is just after 10 a.m. 10 a.m. So it's Wednesday night here and it's Thursday morning there. And what part of South Korea are you in? Nearby Seoul, uh, specifically in Incheon City. OK, how long would it take you to drive to Seoul? Uh, about an hour. You are in South Korea and you are teaching English, right? Uh, that's right. Now, what brought you to South Korea? Originally, I met some Korean study partners. Mm -hmm. We became friends, and that's kind of what prompted me to come to South Korea to stay in touch with some people. Since then, I've been working and teaching English, and also I discovered Bitcoin just about a year ago. In order to teach English in South Korea, do you have any ESL training courses that you took? Initially, no, but over time, I did get some additional certification. I got an ESL certificate later on. I see. You know, I signed up for that here in Nashville years ago, and I started in the program, and then it turned out the woman who was going to teach the class coming down from Canada couldn't make it, right? And so I didn't take the class, so I got a refund for the class. I think how funny fate is that had that woman made it down from Canada, had I taken the course, I really wanted to go travel and teach English somewhere. Who knows what would have happened? My life would be completely different. Two roads diverged in a, what, in a yellow woods, and I took the one less traveled by, something like that. Okay, anyway, so Paul... Tell us, how did you first get into Bitcoin and when? Well, I first heard about Bitcoin in 2011. And when I first heard about it, it was uh, internet money. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was like a completely unheard of concept to me. I looked into it further, but it just didn't seem like worth getting into. After that, I kind of just uh, put it on the background for a while. Then it was after the uh, Cyprus incident in 2013 where Bitcoin exploded in value from like 10 to 100 $200. That's when it really like front and center what I became interested in. I see. And now as far as gold and silver, you also are a gold and silver enthusiast. Some people call those guys gold bugs or silver bugs. Do you consider yourself a gold bug or a silver bug? Correct. Yeah, I am. Uh, certainly to a degree. Yeah. So were you interested in gold and silver before you got into Bitcoin? Yes, I got into it before investing in Bitcoin. All of this interest in um, investing in these things kind of came about at the same time. It was about 2012, but I first started looking into gold and silver, uh, researching that more heavily than Bitcoin. At that time, I put Bitcoin to the side and I was focused on gold and silver. What kind of drew me to it was the intrinsic value argument about it. About gold and silver? If you compare gold and silver and what they call fiat money, where it derives the value from, gold and silver supposedly have this property called like intrinsic value. It's valuable because it's shiny and rare. It also has a few other properties that make it ideal for being used as money. Until around like late 2012, I didn't really put a lot of consideration into how money was created, where money originated from. Mm -hmm. but. It became clear to me that money could be made in unlimited quantities and that the supply of money could expand very drastically under short notice. And it seemed to me uh, that the supply of money was growing. When the 2008 
uh, financial crisis happened, uh, a lot of money supply was created to shore up the financial institutions. And also countries at the same time began to increase their money supply as well. So around the world, it seemed like countries were expanding their money supply at the same time simultaneously. Yeah, I think that's true. I think we still have a race to devalue currency with everybody printing at a rapid uh, at a rabid <laughs> rate. You know, I picture uh, Ben Bernanke. Didn't he move to Mexico? He's living with, uh, what's that guy's name from Facebook? Mm -hmm. But anyway, <laughs> ra you know, <laughs> rabbit where he's foaming at the mouth. All joking aside, though, yeah, it, absolutely that is true that uh, money is being printed at an unprecedented rate and put into the system basically to shore up the system uh, to make sure that things don't fail, uh, kind of a kicking the can down the road. I think it's something that a lot of people in the Bitcoin world take pretty seriously, and I think a lot of people who have gotten into Bitcoin and who have gotten into gold and silver over the past, let's say decade uh, are seeing for the very first time really we're the first people to see hey the, <laughs> this Federal Reserve that's printing money they're not the good guys necessarily right whereas prior to that I think a lot of people just took it for granted that hey well they're the good guys and they're the government certainly they're doing something that's you know above board but I think we all those of us in the know now kind of look at it a little bit differently and we don't have the same faith in fiat you know money that that we used to and you know most people don't realize the the actual word fiat means money by decree so you know it's actually money because they say it's money and they have tanks and drones and planes and everything else and the irs to back it up if you don't agree this is money and don't agree to pay your taxes with this fiat currency you're going to be in trouble right if you're another country trying to move away from the u.s dollar you're going to be in trouble if you're a u.s citizen trying to get away without paying taxes you're going to be in trouble so let's talk about silver a little bit you know the same thing for me i got into silver starting about 2009 and i was listening to peter schiff and a lot of these other uh, <laughs> fast talking chaps on the internet and learning about silver and learning about how it was going to skyrocket and Max Kaiser was saying silver is going to be at $10,000 an ounce in the next year and the collapse is near and all of these other grandiose statements and hyperbole going on but you know I was really interested in silver and I was going around I was putting ads out and I was buying silver coins dimes and quarters and half dollars and silver dollars from people and giving a fair price but making a little bit of money on it and reselling some of it and buying again and I don't have a lot but, you know, I have a little that I think is uh, going to help me in the future. What have you done as far as buying silver? I use um, online retailers like Abmex okay. to purchase uh, basically bullion, silver eagles and maples and uh, things like that. Oh, nice. That's how I've been acquiring like uh, silver and gold. I got into gold and silver when I started doing like the research about it. Like what is the intrinsic value? It's interesting like Gold and silver, they have, they say, five attributes that you probably know about, mm -hmm. like durability. It's a good form of money because it uh, lasts for a long time. Mm -hmm. It can stand up to weather and it doesn't uh, corrode or deteriorate. Mm -hmm. It's also portable, it's divisible, it's fungible, right. and it's scarce. The fact that it can't be created like we you know, talked about fiat money, countries are expanding their money supply at the same time. So this seemed like a way to sidestep that by going into uh, precious metals. I am still really interested in precious metals. I really don't have the money to go out and buy a lot in precious metals. I think if I did, I would invest a fair amount in gold. And I think I would also invest a fair amount in silver. I don't know about platinum and palladium, but uh, yeah, gold and silver definitely. And you know, what a lot of people don't realize is that silver has so many uses now in medicine and solar. Of course, solar is on the rise, of course. And then also, you know, people are buying these new silver filters for their swimming pools and they're trying to move away from the filters that use a lot of the harsh chemicals that are harsh on your skin and also harsh for the environment. Most people don't know, going back for hundreds and hundreds, if not thousands of years, people used to put a silver coin into a jug of milk and that would stop the milk from going bad as quickly because silver has antimicrobial qualities. I have a few silver spoons that I bought from a friend and I actually eat. If I'm going to have soup or eat anything with a spoon, I will actually use that silver spoon because I know that it has those antimicrobial qualities. So kind of a funny little story. When my parents were married, they were so poor, they didn't have anything but really just plastic <laughs> utensils. But one of their wedding gifts from somebody in the family, they got a set of silver. So growing 
up. They didn't have any money to go out and buy a stainless steel set or what have you. So we always ate with silver spoons and silver forks and silver knives. So it can be said, if anybody says that John Barrett, he was born with a silver spoon in his mouth, I'll say, hey, yes, I was, and I'm proud of it. <laughs> yeah, I've heard about it. I've also heard about uh, it's a common gift back in the day, giving uh, silver spoons as a gift to a uh, family that has newborn children or like as a wedding gift. It's a great idea. Right. And, you know, in other countries, I know India is uh, one in particular where every wedding there is going to be some exchange of gold. There's going to be some gift giving that is gold. It's going to be good gold, high quality gold, too. So that's huge in other countries. I don't think it's that big here. I know gold does not have nearly as many of the industrial uses that silver has, but gold is still used in a lot of electronics. Obviously, silver is used in a ton of electronics. Uh, and then we have some new things like graphene. Most people don't know about graphene. It's basically graphite. But if you get a chance, anybody out there listening, check out graphene. It is going to be the raw material of the future, like plastic. Things that are now made of plastic will be made of graphene. It's a lot stronger than plastic. It's lightweight. It's stronger than steel. Conducts electricity pretty well. So, you know, we don't know what the future is going to bring in terms of new materials that are discovered or invented um, that could conduct electricity even better than silver and gold. And for the record, folks out there, a lot of People think that gold conducts electricity better than silver. Eh, incorrect. Silver has the highest electrical conductivity as well as the highest thermal conductivity of any metal that is currently known to man on this planet. I'm sure in other galaxies they have metals that uh, conduct much better and, and their periodic table is much larger. It has like 50,000 different elements on it. <laughs> but uh, anyway, so I'm really curious, Paul, about Korea, South Korea. Obviously, you're in a completely different world than if you were in North Korea. I'm glad you're in South Korea. Can you tell our listeners about South Korea and just, you know, some of the interesting things going on there? And, of course, I'd love to hear about geography, the people, what you do in your day-to-day, -day, and then also, at some point, you know, tie it back into Bitcoin. Right. Well, uh, the geography around here is a little bit like the upper northwest corner of my home state, which is South Carolina. In a sense, um, it's more mountainous. There are just like small mountains everywhere. People are very courteous and very helpful. Like when I first arrived here, people seem to have a sense of people who are new to Korea and they tend to gravitate towards people who are newly arrived in Korea. The uh, food here is actually quite excellent. I love Korean food and I eat Korean food every day. What is your favorite Korean dish? My preference always changes. I like uh, jongguk which is fermented uh, soybean paste. Bibimbap, which is rice and vegetables. Say that one again. Uh, bibimbap. Bibimbap, man, that makes me want to dance. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, it's fantastic food. It's really healthy. Yeah. Okay, so do you speak some Korean yourself? I can speak some Korean. I'm not really great at it, but um, I can get by. Yeah. I see. Okay. So let's talk about Bitcoin in Korea and what you are doing with Bitcoin in Korea. Do you attend a Bitcoin meetup group on a regular basis there? I just started doing that. I went to uh, my first Bitcoin meetup last weekend, actually. Oh, wow. How was that? Uh, it was very interesting. There are some pretty knowledgeable people there. And uh, a few of the members are actually going to the Shanghai conference, which is coming up this weekend. Oh, wow. That's cool, man. I'd love to be going to that. That would be such a dream. That would be so much fun. So how many people attended the Bitcoin meetup you just went to? Uh, this one that I went to, there was about a dozen people. They say that usually there are more people, somewhere between 20 to 30 people uh, that usually attend okay. the regular meeting. Okay. And do you feel like from what you gather talking with those people and also from other people you talk with, on and offline, do you feel like Bitcoin is gaining in popularity there in South Korea? I feel that way. There's more awareness for Bitcoin. People seem to have heard about it before, like like a year ago or a year and a half ago. Nobody had heard of it, but now it's got some presence. It's got some visibility, especially after both of the price rises in 2013. Right. I think it became quite visible. I see. So let me ask you about the economy there in South Korea. How is the economy? I really confess I know nothing about the economy of South Korea. Well, it's an export dependent economy. Mm -hmm. They have lots of uh, trading firms and uh, many people work in like the export sector, forging uh, business ties and 
uh, trying to export products abroad. Also, most of the people I know work, I guess, in the um, service economy. I have a few friends who are restaurateurs, coffee shop owners, um, other teachers. There seems to be full employment here for the most part. Okay. But not every job is particularly a great job. You know, most people work long hours. Benefits may vary. And in like the informal sector, there are no benefits at all. I see. And how about uh, inflation of the currency? Are you seeing any of that like we're seeing in a lot of places? Things have gotten a little more expensive. When I first came to Korea, everything seemed remarkably cheap. To go out to eat, it would cost 4 to $5 approximately. That's pretty nice. Yeah, uh, but I don't think it's that way anymore. Now it's about 5 to $7, so I think some inflation has been in effect. I see. Over the past three years or so. Well, that doesn't surprise me. Now, how long have you been there? Three years, you said? Three and a half continuously, yeah. Three and a half, okay. And at one point, in one of our email conversations, you mentioned something about a wedding you had attended. Tell our listeners about that. That sounded like fun. Right. Uh, this was a coworker of mine. Uh, he and I were good friends. And I started getting interested in Bitcoin in 2013. And I was talking to him about it. And when he got married, um, I decided to give him Bitcoin as a gift. At that time, it was about $100 hmm. per Bitcoin. So I gave him and his wife two Bitcoin. I wrote a uh, private key, public key address, and 12-word passphrase for blockchain.info wallet mm -hmm. on a note card because I didn't have a printer at the time. And it seemed more secure to do that way than yeah. printing. I gave it to them as a wedding gift. They were appreciative. They were like, thanks for the Bitcoin. And then later that year, it uh, went up in value quite a lot. So they were pretty happy. Nice. Do you think they still have that? Uh, they did sell it, actually. They sold at a higher price than it is now. Uh -huh. But um, I think uh, they're interested in buying back some. So I see. Up to them. <laughs> wow. Yeah. So when you first gave them the Bitcoin, did they even know what it was? My friend did because I had told him about it. And I'm not sure his wife probably didn't know what it was. But I think before that, they were probably ambivalent about it or they didn't have, you know, an opinion about it. To them, it was just, what is this, some share in something? That's difficult to understand if you've never studied it yourself. When Coinbase first offered the ability to send Bitcoin to someone by way of their email, address i would say a dozen times i've sent you know between five and ten dollars to different people uh, i sent some to my sister she accepted it and then uh, sent some to another relative and they accepted it and then uh, just a scattering of friends i sent some bitcoin to and they never you know you have to actually open the email and then you have to open a free coinbase account and then you have to you know basically move that in uh, to your Coinbase wallet. It's a very easy process. It's a no brain process. It's just completely intuitive the way they have it set up. But some of these people just never claimed it. And it, of course, then it goes back to me. And I thought, wow, I wonder if in the future they'll be kicking themselves like, oh, I remember he sent me point one Bitcoin, <laughs> you know, and now each Bitcoin is worth $100,000. That would have been $10,000. I blew it. You know, I don't know. I can't say. I can't say what the future of Bitcoin looks like. Certainly nobody can, uh, although I hear people predicting what it's going to be all the time. It's kind of interesting. The optimism and the pessimism, the two, you know, polar opposites from people who are completely convinced that they know what's going to happen with uh, the Bitcoin price. Okay, so Paul, tell us something else about South Korea that you think maybe we would want to know or something else about Bitcoin in South Korea that you think maybe we would want to know. Well, there is a Bitcoin ATM in South Korea. Oh, nice. And it's uh, located actually the same venue that the Bitcoin group is using to host this Bitcoin meetup. And what is that venue? That venue is a coffee shop. Actually, the name escapes me at the moment. There's a couple of Korean Bitcoin startups. There's uh, Corbit and Coinplug. Okay. One of them, I met the guy who runs Coinplug. He has a, it's almost like a Coinbase wallet. Uh -huh. They have the private keys on their side and it's kind of set up that way. You can buy and you can sell and they can hold on the Bitcoin for you. And it's like a mobile app that they have. I believe that actually got started. I believe that's actually less than a year old, that company. Okay, that's cool. Now, have you used the Bitcoin ATM there? No, I have checked it out. Um, I haven't bought or sold any Bitcoin through there, but um, I have looked at it. It's pretty neat. 
you scan a QR code or pull up a QR code on your phone and it scans from your phone and transfers the Bitcoin that way. Okay, and do you have to put into the machine any of your personal information? No, I don't believe so. You can uh, use cash and it can just be a uh, Bitcoin to cash transfer and you don't need to interact with your bank account. It does have a slot for a card, I think, so you can debit your account but um, you can use cash. I see. So is that just a one-way machine? You can just buy Bitcoin. Can you also sell Bitcoin into that machine and get cash? I believe you can buy and sell. Okay. And just on the subject of cash, a fiat currency there in South Korea, what is the currency there in South Korea? That, that would be the uh, one. The one. Okay. And can you easily go to a bank and just get a good exchange rate, you know, for exchanging U.S. dollars or what have you with a debit card in a bank easily? Yeah, very easily. Very easily. No problem at all. Wow. Sounds like just a different world there than what people are experiencing in uh, in Argentina. I just interviewed a guy from Argentina, and it just uh, sounds like a different world, man. Very interesting. Well, I'll tell you what, Paul, thank you so much for being on the show. Let me ask you, is there a way that our listeners can get in touch with you there in South Korea if they want to communicate with you? Uh, yeah, absolutely. You can contact me through Gmail. My email address is B U G G E dot p-a-u-l at gmail.com also i have a page on facebook that is paul buggy so uh, you can hit me up there all right great and uh, if you would tell our south korean listeners thank you for listening and goodbye or something like that in korean right <laughs> all right paul hey thanks so much for being on the show and we'll talk to you soon all right thank you uh-huh. bye-bye I'd like to thank our guests on today's show, Nick Gogarty, co-developer and author of the Solar Coin White Paper and author of the book, The Nature of Value. I'd also like to thank Paul Buggy there in South Korea. To find out more about my guests and sponsors, check out the show notes on the Let's Talk Bitcoin page, on SoundCloud, or on bitcoinsandgravy.com. Thanks for tuning into the show, and if you really do like the show and you aren't just faking it, please tell your friends about it or send them a link to the show. And remember the Bitcoins and Gravy hotline. Have you ever wanted to be a podcaster? Then call Bitcoins and Gravy at 615-208-5198 and leave a message with your comments, questions, or complaints. This is your chance to give me a piece of your mind and tell me what you really think about the show. (laughs) And if you give me your permission, I will put your call-in comments on the show. And, of course, I offer a number of ways for you to download all of the past podcasts. You can go to letstalkbitcoin.com or directly from SoundCloud, or you can go to the website, which, of course, is bitcoinsandgravy.com. If you've enjoyed the show, please take a minute to leave a review on SoundCloud. And remember, it's your reviews and comments that help new listeners discover Bitcoins and Gravy, plus all the other great podcasts, articles, and links that can be found on the Let's Talk Bitcoin network. I also thank you for your generous donations in Bitcoin or Litecoin that help me keep the lights on and coffee in the kettle. Signing off now from East Nashville, Tennessee, I'm your host, John Barrett, with my trusty companion, Maxwell. Say goodbye, Maxwell. (laughs) Wishing you all a great week. Y'all be good to each other out there now, and remember the only thing necessary for the triumph of evil 